We're turning now to the intersections of a number of different things we've been talking about, specifically the post-World War II Nazi underground and overground, in fact, and not only Palestinian terrorism, but as we're going to see now, other elements of supposedly left European terrorism. Continuing now with Unhealed Wounds by Erna Paris. Following the Breguet cop affair, Jacques Verger became the lawyer for Mohand Hamami, that's H-A-M-A-M-I, and Frédéric Auriac, O-R-I-A-C-H, both members of the Paris-based multinational terror band called Direct Action, which was created in 1979. Hamami and Auriac were accused of breaking into an arsenal of arms that was under police surveillance. Auriac was also the editor of a glossy anti-Zionist, anti-imperialist review called Subversion, a descendant of Verger's seminal publication, O Evolution, which was described as, quote, a political and theoretical instrument at the disposition of militant revolutionaries, unquote. Furthermore, according to Italian magistrates interviewed by Le Figaro, Hamami was at the heart of a triple connection, Red Brigades, Direct Action, and the Lebanese Armed Revolutionary Faction. A lot of interesting things in that particular passage, as short as it was. First of all, the fact that Direct Action which is very much on the scene today, has been very active in recent we, recent months and years, is and has been represented as a leftist terrorist organization, that they should have this sort of connections to Jacques Verger, an ambiguous individual, but a, a fellow who has documented connections to Nazi financier Francois Genoux. It's interesting that uh, this, this uh, direct action group should have that kind of a connection. Furthermore, the direct action would be linked with the Red Brigades, is also intriguing, of course, in our series, our Radio Free America series about the shooting of the Pope, we took a look at how Lizio Gelli of the P2 faction, the P2 Lodge, in Italy, is, was credited with having a great deal to do with founding the Red Brigades. And, of course, the Red Brigades have been instrumental in the so-called strategy of tension, which in turn has been the, uh, well, it, it's been instrumental in driving the Italian pu uh, public to the right, and uh, of course their their terrorist strategy is very discrediting to the left in general. In fact, the, the Italian Communist Party has completely disowned the Red Brigades. Continuing now with the last section that we're going to be looking at this evening from Unhealed Wounds by Erna Paris, and again, further developments connecting the Palestinian terrorist movement with the elements, uh, with surviving elements of the Third Reich that is surviving the end of Second World War. By 1985, the alliance of the old-style fascist right and the new-style revolutionary left have become more visible. The seeds of Nasser's Cairo in the 1950s and the 1969 meeting of the new European order in Madrid bearing fruit. In 1985, one of the left-wing Armenian terrorists defended by Jacques Verger was found to be carrying a German passport that had been stolen by the neo-Nazi Hoffmann Group and distributed, distributed in a PFLP training camp in Lebanon. And in April of 1985, an important double arrest in Paris netted Odfried Hepp, H-E-P-P, -P, the last member of a, at large of the same Hoffman organization in the company of a Tunisian member of the Palestine Liberation Front. Hepp was suspected of having planned and or participated in the anti-Semitic attack on, attack on Goldenberg's restaurant in Paris in 1982. Hepp, however, claimed to be a member in good standing of the Palestine Liberation Front, Abu Abbas branch with its base in Tunis. I'm going to read that last sentence again because it's very significant. This Odfried Hepman, remember, is a member of the neo-Nazi Hoffmann sport group Hoffmann, a, a very powerful and well-connected Nazi group in Germany. Hep, however, claimed to be a member in good standing of the Palestine Liberation Front, Abu Abbas branch, with its base in Tunis. According to Art Heinz Marx, associate president until his arrest in 1984 of the neo-Nazi National Socialist Front in Frankfurt, both Hep and Marx trained in an El Fatah camp in Lebanon from July of 1980 until July, July of June of 1981 with a group of 15 German neo-Nazis. Quote, I was a member of El Fatah, a Fedayeen, said Marx. El Fatah and the PLO are fighting for the rights of their people as we are fighting for the German people. The Palestinians and ourselves have the same enemy, international Zionism and the Jews. Marx added that guerrilla training in Lebanon was not that guerrillas training in Lebanon were not intended to attack Israel directly, but were preparing quote for combat in Europe unquote. As for Francois Genoux, his connections to both Nazism and the extreme left were evident and ongoing. In June of 1984, a Zurich newspaper pointedly reported that he had close ties with the Libyan embassy in Bern. Reading that last sentence again, in June of 1984. A Zurich newspaper pointedly reported that he had close ties with the Libyan embassy in Bern. And his own daughter, Martine, 
had been married to a revolutionary who was killed in an internecine battle in Lebanon in the early 1980s. A couple of comments uh, about the last passage that we just read. One of the interesting things about the Nazi milieu that we've been discussing being connected with the Abul Abbas is that Abbas was connected, at least in the American press, and perhaps in reality, I can't say, but with the hijacking of the Achille Loro in 1985. That was one of a series of terrorist acts that, uh, well, garnered, would completely dominated the American press in mid-1985, and which culminated in the uh, hijacking of an airliner carrying the, uh, or the, the, the abduction, perhaps, hijacking, whatever you want to call it, of an airliner carrying some of the terrorists involved in this incident by uh, aircraft from U.S. carriers with the 6th Fleet. They were forced down in Italy. So it's interesting to have these Nazi connections with the Abul Abbas branch, the group credited with the Achille Loro hijacking. It's also interesting that in uh, June of 84, a Zurich newspaper should report that Francois Genoux, the Nazi financier who's been front and center in this section we've been looking at, should have close ties with the Libyan embassy in Bern. That is uh, an interesting connection, obviously, falls directly in line with the the historical thread that we've been tracing here. Now, before we go back and review the uh, section from Unhealed Wounds that we've been looking at, uh, by the way, after this there'll be some more information in the prepared portion of the broadcast, uh, it should be worth commenting that uh, although the, this intersection that we're seeing here of the Nazi underground and overground, I guess we could say, post-World War II with the Palestinian movement, uh, which is generally thought of as being left-wing, is uh, sort of a, a marriage, or as the Germans like to say, an interesting Gemeinschaft, or community of interests. The Although the alliances here appear to be very sound and are obviously totally consistent with the information we developed in Radio Free America number 22, it should be noted that the motivations for uh, the various elements involved here are not necessarily the same. Uh, the Nazis, of course, uh, would appear to be motivated by probably two main uh, themes in terms of their actions vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. First of all, obviously, anti-Semitism. But beyond that, the Nazis obviously are interested in establishing fascism and totalitarian governments of a right-wing nature. As we looked at in an article called Chercher les Provocateurs in the New York Times, in which the French discussed the tremendous uh, utility of agent provocateur for the right wing, the establishment of left-wing terrorism, which is in turn very beneficial to the right. We looked at a phrase which said that it's always a traditional French phrase, which said it's always good to be a, a, a traditional French right-wing phase phrase, excuse me, which said that basically it's always good to let a few shops burn. In other words, uh, allowing uh, some left-wing terrorism is, is extremely beneficial for the right. We've spoken about the theme of provocation many, many times in the context of our broadcasts. Provocation, of course, is the setting up of a terrorist incident to be blamed on one's opposition and perhaps involving gullible elements of one's opposition in order to destroy that very opposition. The Nazis, of course, and we've looked at the tremendous continuity between Nazi intelligence and U.S. intelligence, which obviously is uh, something which is uh, current current even to this day with connections like the, uh, the, the Fritz Kramer connection that we looked at last week and uh, the Helena von Damme connection to Otto von Bolschwing and others that we've looked at. The Galen connection, is, as far back as it may reach, is still regrettably very current. Of course, provocation was one of the Nazis' main, stock, main uh, devices. The Reichstag fire was what Hitler used to defame the communists and seize dictatorial powers. The Gleibitz provocation was what Hitler used to invade Poland. And when Hitler wanted to generate popular sentiment for a war in the West, the Gestapo set off a fake bomb, well, actually it was a real bomb, supposedly an attempt on Hitler's life, that in turn was blamed on British and French intelligence and served as a very useful device for whipping up war sentiment against the Western nations, whereas previously many Germans had been uh, reluctant to support the idea of a wider war in the West. Now, the Palestinian terrorists operating both in Europe and in the Middle East have generally, in the West, driven popular, popular sentiment to the right. The Palestinians themselves could perhaps be said to be motivated by two themes. Uh, obviously, they are anti-Zionist hyphen anti-Semitic. One could uh, choose what sort of phrase one wants, but uh, the, the distinctions have become somewhat blurred, regrettably. And uh, also, of course, they are motivated by uh, the, the motivated by Palestinian nationalism. It's worth noting that the uh, people involved at the at, at, at the operational level, at least from the Palestinian end, are not necessarily doctrinaire Nazis at all. They may very well be sincere in their beliefs of uh, that, that, that their actions will further the cause of Palestinian nationalism. Of course, as we've seen uh, all about us, the, uh, the Arab terrorists have in fact served to not only discredit Palestinian nationalism, but to fuel anti-Arab sentiment in the West 
in general. And uh, as with the Red Brigades, uh, most of whose uh, operational participants, I think we can assume, are sincere left-wing fanatics, they are actually damaging the cause they, pre- they pretend to be supporting in some cases, or in many cases are actually supporting. So we actually have a marriage of interests here, although the Nazis are working with this group, they are not necessarily motivated by all of the same things. By the same token, we've looked at the, the documented connections between Western intelligence and these same groups, not only between the BND, the Galen Organization, and its final incarnation as the West German Intelligence Service, but also through Ali Hassan Salome and others, the CIA, to the same groups, or I should say Western intelligence, to the same groups. But just as it has uh, in, around the world, Palestinian terrorism and terrorism in general has served to generate to drive the American public opinion to the right. And in fact, obviously, particularly in the 1980s, we've taken a look at... Uh, terrorism as sort of the war cry of the Reagan administration. We are being encouraged to give up our civil liberties at home in order to combat the terrorist menace, and by the same token, we're being encouraged to support military expansionism abroad, again, to combat the terrorist menace. So it's worth noting here that although although we have a diverse, uh, many diverse elements involved in these operations, they are not necessarily all operating from the same perspective. The Nazis and CIA in particular, and of course they're very closely related, are perhaps uh, very adept, or uh, they're definitely very adept at using other groups whose interests might actually be at variance with their own in the ultimate analysis in order to further their own ends. I think it's a a point that should be made here, because uh, although they're operating together, they're not necessarily operating for the same reasons. Before we take another short musical break, let's uh, take just a minute here to sum up the information that we've been looking at this evening. We began by taking a look at Francois Genoux, the Nazi financier who was not only financing Jacques Verger's defense of Klaus Barbie in France, but who also was a very close affiliate of the Third Reich before, during, and after World War II. Before World War II, he struck up an acquaintance with Hajamin al-Husseini, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem and SS officer. He worked for the Germans during the war. After World War II, he not only became the heir to many of the Nazi political tracts, including Hitler's political testament, in which he encouraged the Third World to carry on Hitler's struggle against the Jews, but also he became the controller of the post-World War II Nazi treasury, which is also interesting. He also, that is, Genou, was affiliated with the Egyptian intelligence service during the 50s. That intelligence service sprang full-grown from a group of Nazi war criminals operating on behalf of CIA through the Galen organization. And uh, it was during this, this uh, stay also that he be, re- became reaffiliated with Hajamin al-Husseini. We took a look at Hajamin al-Husseini at the Bandung Conference in Indonesia, which first formed the, con- the concept of the Third World. Hajamin al-Husseini was a key participant. In 19, said, we also took a look at, in 1969, how the post-World War II Nazi movement, or neo-Nazi movement, however you want to put it, became very much involved with supporting the Palestinian cause. And once again, at uh, a meeting of the new n- new European order, a uh, pan-European fascist movement, we took a look at Hajamin al-Husseini, once again, uh, I guess you could say, rearing his head on behalf of the cause he had uh, supported for so long. Following that, we took a look at intersecting links between Jacques Verger, Francois Genoux, Ali Hassan Salome of Black September, the leader of the Olympics massacre, Carlos the Jackal, and Moamir Gaddafi. I think I'm not going to detail all of these connections, but there were uh, the, the, the Verger, Francois Genoux, Salome, Carlos, Gaddafi uh, connections were detailed quite nicely in the section that we looked at from Unhealed Wounds. Following that, we took a look at some more connections between Francois Genoux, Jacques Berger, and the so-called Friends of Carlos, apparently two European terrorists who were op- operating on behalf of Carlos the Jackal. And, of course, Carlos the Jackal, along with Gaddafi, got aid directly from Frank Turple and Edwin Wilson, the U.S. intelligence agents who, whether or not they were still working for CIA or some other U.S. intelligence agency, such as, uh, say, NSA, DIA, or uh, Naval Intelligence or something else, they armed Gaddafi on behalf of the U.S. national security establishment. We also took a look at connections between the group Direct Action and the Francois Genoux, Jacques Berger milieu. Finally, we took a look at some connecting links between, among others, Abul Abbas, or Abdul Abbas, the neo-Nazi group, and again, the, some of the same Palestinian terrorist groups that we've been looking at in connection with the, this uh, uh, milieu that we've been examining in this first portion of the broadcast. As I said, uh, the information that we've been covering from Unhealed Wounds is going to go into the archives at DAVCOR as a supplement to Radio Free America number 22. Returning now to the intersections of a number of different things we've been talking about, specifically the post-World War II Nazi underground and overground, in fact, 
and not only Palestinian terrorism, but as we're going to see now, other elements of supposedly left European terrorism. Continuing now with Unhealed Wounds by Erna Paris. Following the Breguet cop affair, Jacques Verger became the lawyer for Mohand Hamami, that's H-A-M-A-M-I, and Frédéric Auriac, O-R-I-A-C-H, both members of the Paris-based multinational terror band called Direct Action, which was created in 1979. A lot of interesting things in that particular passage, as short as it was. First of all, the fact that Direct Action, which is very much on the scene today, has been very active in recent we, recent months and years, is and has been represented as a leftist terrorist organization, that they should have this sort of connections to Jacques Verger, an ambiguous individual, but a, a fellow who has documented connections to Nazi financier Francois Genoux. It's interesting that... Uh, this this uh, direct action group should have that kind of a connection. Furthermore, the direct action would be linked with the Red Brigades is also intriguing. Of course, in our series, our Radio Free America series about the shooting of the Pope, we took a look at how Licio Gelli of the P2 faction, the P2 Lodge in Italy, is, was credited with having a great deal to do with founding the Red Brigades. And of course, the Red Brigades have been instrumental in the so-called strategy of tension, which in turn has been... The uh, well, it, it's been instrumental in driving the Italian pu- public to the right, and uh, of course their their terrorist strategy is very discrediting to the left in general. In fact, the the Italian Communist Party has completely disowned the Red Brigades. Continuing now with the last section that we're going to be looking at this evening, from Unhealed Wounds by Erna Paris, and again further developments connecting the Palestinian terrorist movement with the elements uh, with surviving elements of the Third Reich that is surviving the end of the Second World War. By 1985, the alliance of the old-style fascist right and the new-style revolutionary left had become more visible. The seeds of Nasser's Cairo in the 1950s and the 1969 meeting of the new European order in Madrid bearing fruit. In 1985, one of the left-wing Armenian terrorists defended by Jacques Verger was found to be carrying a German passport that Hamami and Oriak were accused of breaking into an arsenal of arms that was under police surveillance. Oriak was also the editor of a glossy, anti-Zionist, anti-imperialist review called Subversion, a descendant of Verger's seminal publication, O Evolution, which was described as, quote, a political and theoretical instrument at the disposition of militant revolutionaries, unquote. Furthermore, according to Italian magistrates interviewed by Le Figaro, Hamami was at the heart of a triple connection, Red Brigades, Direct Action, and the Lebanese Armed Revolutionary Faction. <laughs> 